Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the Making SAR Data Accessible New Sensors, Tools, and Services webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. While everybody's logging in here, we do have two optional polls, and you'll find those located at the bottom left and the middle portion of your page. And I'd like to thank all of you who've already answered those polls um, for your feedback. It is 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. And what I'd like to do first is go over just a few logistics related to this webinar. To ensure the best audio experience, the conference has been placed in silent mode. However, if you have any issues or you have any questions, please enter those into the Q&A pod located on the right-hand side of your screen. This works like a chat. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted to our online Adobe Connect webinar catalog, as well as to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a couple of days of completion. And what I'll do is I will send an email to all of the registrants uh, with links both to the YouTube recording, uh, excuse me, to the YouTube uh, file as well as the direct link which will allow you to download the presentation files at the end. As far as timing is concerned, today's webinar will be one hour long. We've allocated 45 minutes to the presentation and live demonstrations and an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. Once our speaker has finished with his presentation, we will then transition to an optional set of polling questions. And then what we'll do then is we'll move directly to the Q&A period. And then just one final note, depending upon the volume of questions that we receive today, we'll extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes to 3.15 p.m. for those of you who may wish to stay on the line. Our speaker today is Dr. Franz Meyer, who is the Chief Scientist at the NASA Alaska Satellite Facility Distributed Active Archive Center, or ASF-DAC. And what I'd like to do next is pull up today's agenda. You can see an outline as to what we'll be discussing today. During today's webinar, our speaker will start off by discussing the benefits of synthetic aperture radar, or SAR data, for Earth observations. And then from here, he will discuss ways that the ASF-DAC is making these data more accessible through a variety of value-added data product services and data discovery and access tools. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a summary of today's topics and also some additional information about SAR resources. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Franz Meyer. Franz? Hey, this is Franz Meyer from ASF uh, in beautiful Fairbanks, Alaska. I hope you all can hear me fine. Um, I'm going to try to follow the, um, the um, chat window also to see if there are any problems. Uh, let me share my screen. <coughs> so you, should, you also should see my presentation slides now. Um, so as Jennifer already mentioned, we'll talk about um, uh, SAR and how SAR has really come along over the last few years and, uh, you know, how ASF is trying to support um, the users, the new users of SAR in, in, by making SAR data sets more accessible. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, data sets uh, and, and how we make them available to you and then also some new tools that hopefully will make it easier for you, especially the people that come that are new to SAR, uh, to utilize this data set more, more effectively. <clears throat> So my outline of my talk um, is um, coming up now, I hope, okay. So first, uh, let, me, uh, let me talk to you a little bit about ASF itself. So ASF, as Jennifer mentioned, is the NASA Alaska Satellite Facility Distributed Active Archive Center. Um, so basically, it's the main uh, SAR archive um, that NASA is, uh, or the, the, the main NASA SAR archive. Uh, ASF has been around uh, in Fairbanks, Alaska since 1991. Uh, started out as mainly a downlink center, so we downloaded data sets from uh, NASA assets and um, NASA contracted assets, um, and then has grown from there into a data um, archive center, um, and uh, currently we are hosting about uh, nine petabytes of SAR data sets, uh, reaching back all the way to, nine, to 1997, uh, 1979, and um, What's interesting, I think, about ASF and which make, what makes us different from most other data centers is that all our nine, nine petabytes are all on spinning disk. So every single data set that is in the archive is ready for your download at your fingertips. And just briefly, ASF is only one of many NASA uh, DACs, uh, NASA data centers. Uh, so 
ASF is in Fairbanks, Alaska. That's shown here on the very left in the usual uh, geographically incorrect location uh, of Alaska. Uh, and then we have uh, several data centers that are spread out throughout uh, the lower 48 um, of the United, United States, some of which you may have interacted with before. Uh, maybe you have worked with the NSIDC DAC or, or the LP, the Land Processes DAC, before. Um, what's nice, and I'm going to talk about this also later again, what's nice about the uh, NASA DAC system is that it operates under what's called a single sign-on concept. So if you have a username and password to any archives, uh, any of the NASA DAC uh, archives, this one uh, password is, and username is working for all of the DACs. So if you've worked with NSIDC before and you have a password for their archive, then uh, this same password should work for the archives of ASF. So let me just uh, briefly talk about uh, you know, why you might be interested in SAR. Of course, you have your own ideas. But uh, as you know, uh, remote sensing has always been a very useful instrument for doing Earth observation. And we have used it in the past for you know, looking at a lot of dynamic signals. Uh, we've looked at things that relate to natural hazards, such as the shown oil spill, uh, flooding, volcano um, uh, mapping and monitoring efforts. Uh, but we also have looked at uh, issues really related to national security or issues related to climate change. Um, and what makes um, why a remote sensing is useful is or, or a useful remote sensing instrument uh, has some key capabilities. Um, it provides high uh, or high enough resolution uh, data images that are covering uh, large areas of the globe, ideally covering the entire globe. And they provide uh, data sets that are frequently acquired and regularly observed so that we can build a nice uh, regularly observed time series. And ideally, we want this time series to be long so that we can look at um, you know, developing uh, signals on the surface over long time spans. <clears throat> and if we do this right, and if we have the right instrument, uh, then we can get, even just by uh, analyzing visually data sets over time, we can extract a, a huge amount of information about the surface. So, so this is a time series of Landsat data over Las Vegas, um, very long time series starting in the 1970s. And just by visually analyzing these data sets, we can understand, understand a lot about the dynamics of uh, features on the ground. We can see the growth of Las Vegas, and we can see the drainage of Lake Mead next to it um, as, as the uh, water consumption of Las Vegas increased. Um, so this is a NASA data, uh, actually a Landsat data set um, and created by a com uh, collaboration between NASA and USGS. So very useful if we have these regularly observed data sets. However, of course, optical sensors have some limitations, most of which relate to uh, the presence of clouds. Um, so this map shows you the, the likelihood of encountering clouds over um, different areas of the globe. Uh, areas shaded in white um, are frequently cloud covered. You can see that optical data sets have some limitations in these areas in terms of providing these regularly sampled data sets that we are interested in. Um, so that's where SAR comes in. So SAR is um, an instrument uh, using microwave uh, signals. The, tr the signals are actively transmitted from a uh, transmitter on the spacecraft. And that gives us full day and night capabilities uh, because of the active transmission of signals. And it makes it all weather capable because Microwave signals can penetrate through clouds and through precipitation. And so that's ideal for Earth observation, because it, then it allows you to, it's a, a, a true 24-7 instrument, and it allows you to look at dynamic signals like this one shown here. If you look on the right-hand side, what you see here is, a, is um, an image of a volcano in the Aleutians of Alaska. And in the center of this image, where my mouse pointer is right now, you see a feature growing in the crater of this volcano, a volcanic dome. Um, related to um, hazardous activity at this volcano. And, and SAR was an essential tool at the time to monitor this event, because most of the optical data sets were clouded up in, in this part of the globe. So in addition to providing these regularly sampled image data sets and the weather-independent image data sets, SAR has another capability. Uh, with every data set, we are not only acquiring an image, but for every pixel, we are also measuring what's called the uh, interfer or the a phase measurement. The phase is essentially a proxy for the distance between the satellite in space and a point on ground. And so if we repeat measurements over time, we can track this distance over time. We can extract through a technique called interferometric uh, radar or INSAR, 
we can extract uh, deformations on the surface that may relate either to um, to any kind of dynamic signals like uh, glacier flow or like in this case, um, these colored fringes here uh, that you see are related to an earthquake that happened at the time. Uh, so we can use that to understand uh, the, you know, dynamic features on the ground even more. So it's a very useful instrument, but of course SAR has been around for a while uh, and still many of you may, may not have used SAR in the past. And the reason why the application of SAR has been a little bit uh, more limited in, in, the, in the past was because of three main reasons. Uh, one of them is, <clears throat> showing all the way on the left here, is that SAR has been often a little bit difficult to deal with. Um, data sets uh, come in strange formats, and the processing flows uh, of you know, creating information from SAR data is often complicated um, and has limited the size of the community a little bit. Also important all the way on the right in this um, three-part plot is that data used to be expensive. Uh, many SAR data sets, um, you know, you'd had to purchase in the past, which limited uh, their use. And then in the middle, um, SAR data or past systems have not uh, observed the planet regularly, uh, which, uh, you know, led to some sparsity of temporal samples and irregular sampling. And also that made it a little less useful for looking at dynamic features, especially for looking at hazard signals. Um, so many of these things have changed in the past, and really in this presentation I'm going to try to highlight some of the recent progress that was made by the community and also partly by ASF to alleviate some of these initial problems. And hopefully you can take advantage of this recent, uh, this recent progress. So let me start talking about sensors. Uh, this is not an ASF uh, contribution, but it's really a comp contribution of the launch agencies and the space agencies of the world. Sentinel-1 foremost might be the reason why you're on the call today. Uh, Sentinel-1 is an is a ESA-launched uh, system launched in 2015 and 2016, C-band uh, radar systems. And it's one of the first um, operational radar systems. So it's a data set that is now regularly sampled, and it's also freely and openly available. So these new sensors that are listed here, Sentinel-1 being already in space, and then future systems like NISAR, uh, a U.S. and uh, Indian Space Agency-based instrument that's going to be launched in 2022. They will make um, Earth observation um, possible. Earth observation, like shown here on the left in this, in this animation. Um, so this is a sea ice animation where you now, by just looking at the time series of these images, you can understand how sea ice uh, uh, moves and how sea ice gets exported, in this case, out of the Arctic just by analyzing and looking at, at images. So um, the, the density of samples uh, makes um, SAR much more useful for, for many geophysical applications. Just a few more words on Sentinel-1. So really um, um, kudos to ESA, to European Space Agency, who has really changed uh, or shifted the paradigm in SAR by providing this amazing instrument, uh, Sentinel-1, uh, is providing uh, regular samples every six days. I have the capability to do so by using two uh, uh, spacecraft in the same orbital plane. Um, it is specifically designed for interferometric SAR processing, so it allows not only imaging but also uh, looking at surface deformations on the ground. Um, and it provides data sets, most importantly, free and open, um, and so a really amazing accessible data sets uh, that many of you might be interested in using. Just uh, putting out a plug for NISAR. Uh, so NISAR is the, uh, the NASA ISRO uh, Synthetic Aperture Radar Mission, uh, an LVAN SAR mission to be launched early in 2020, 2022. Um, what you see in this photograph here is in the background you see a model of NISAR. So it's a little bit of a different design. You have the main radar instrument on the bottom and then a large reflector array that is um, um, basically uh, sending these, these radar signals to the ground and receiving them back. And the people that you see here is the NISAR science team, including the NISAR, um, the NISAR um, lead scientist Paul Rosen here in the front. Everybody's very happy as we prepare the mission for launch. So stay tuned for NISAR. It's coming around and it's going to provide more free and open globally sampled data sets. Um, <clears throat> so, so now to, uh, to some demonstrations. So if you have, if you're interested in Sentinel-1, and I, I saw from the poll earlier, a lot of you are new SAR users, and a lot of you have not interacted with our search client in the past. Um, ASF is one of uh, one of two um, uh, uh, places where you can get 
uh, the entire or can have access to the entire access of Sentinel, uh, of uh, the entire archive of Sentinel One data. Um, and so ASF operates a search client that uh, is called Vertex. This is the main interface that I will show you here in a second. Um, and we are constantly improving the search client. So I'm going to give you a demo here in a second. And I will also show you some of the new features that are in Vertex in case you've used uh, Vertex in the past, um, 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 but uh, you, you might want to know of those. We have better parameter search. We have improved download capabilities. And we have some new fe other features that are in, in the uh, archive. So the slide deck is going to be shared with you. And if you go to the slide 16, you'll see there is a link. If you click on this link up here, it will lead you directly to the Vertex uh, search client. But what I will try to demonstrate to you real quick is if you've never been at the ASF archive, how do you find the search client? So you now if you're just in a Google browse engine or search engine, you can type in things like ASF star. Uh, that will lead you directly to um, our archive. You can type in ASF DAC if you want. That also will have us at the very top. Or you can search for things like Alaska Satellite Facility. I can type. And if you do so, you'll see that uh, ASF comes up in the very top. It's the very first link. And if you click on this on this link, you'll get to the ASF homepage, uh, which hopefully gets transferred out to you fine. So it's a, a very simple homepage, and the search client uh, or how to find SAR data is front and center on this on this on this uh, homepage. So this you see uh, here in the middle this large pane which says find SAR. This one will lead you directly to the Vertex, Vertex client. And by the way, if I'm going too fast for you, the, this uh, this video is going to be shared on YouTube, so you can stop here at any time and you can follow along uh, on YouTube uh, on how to use the client. So this is the interface uh, of Vertex, um, um, the, our search and download interface for SAR data. In the middle, uh, you see a large um, map of the globe. This is used uh, for you to be able to give us geographic information of where you want to find data sets. On the left-hand side, you have search um, criteria, criteria that you can set, and on the right-hand side, you get search results once, you, once the search is completed. Um, if you wanted to use the, the client just, just for searching for data sets, you can do that without logging in. If you actually want to uh, download data, then we are requiring a simple login. Um, I had mentioned to you earlier that all of the NASA DAX systems use the same sign-on. So if you already have a sign-on for one of the other DAX, you can use that one. Or you can uh, sign up easily, but this, this sign-up then will also allow you to uh, download data from other from other DACs. So to go to the sign-on on the sort of top right corner, uh, you may see my mouse pointer. There's an Earth, so-called Earth Data login. If you click on that, you get to a, a simple login interface. Um, so um, see here, um, if you already have a username and password, you just type it in here. If not, you can go to on the register, click on the register button. Um, and and there, it's very simple. All you have to provide is a name and a valid email address. We're going to ask some simple questions that help uh, NASA to better understand our users. Uh, things like, you know, what's your main application? What kind of community do you belong to? Um, and, and then you're ready to search the uh, archive. So I'm going to log in real quick. Um, once you click on the login, you're, you're getting um, logged into the, to the NASA Earth Data System. And then you get redirected uh, to the application. Um, and then you see that you're logged in. So now it says, like, log out France. I'm logged in as myself. So once you're logged in, uh, you can uh, download, search and download data. Uh, so you can just zoom into this map. Um, I'm just going to go for fun to Louisiana because they always nice looking images. To, uh, search, uh, to set up a search area uh, with simple mouse click, you can draw up a bounding box. Uh, you can also modify that bounding box after if you want. You can drag and drop corners, and you can reshape it to whatever shape you want uh, very easily. Um, and so once you're happy with your search area, then you've set up the first of the three input criteria uh, that you can set, the geographic region. Then you can decide which kinds of data sets you want to search for. ASF is actually providing access to a range of different star data sets. Um, and if you click on this little data set tab on the side, you see all of these data sets listed from all of the different SAR missions we hold. Um, they, are, they are ranked by date. So you can see they go all the way from 1978 with the launch of CSAT uh, all the way up to uh, Sentinel-1, which is the current data set we hold, a currently flying data set. It includes um, 
uh, spaceborne data like Sentinel-1, but it also includes some of the NASA airborne assets uh, such as UAV SAR, uh, which is uh, currently still flying, or past uh, airborne systems like Air, AirSat, uh, AirSAR. Um, you see that on the side it shows you uh, links. Uh, it shows you, first of all, the, the time frame for each mission. It also shows you links. If you click on one of these links, let me do this real quick, it gives you a quick inf information of what the satellite is about and what kind of data products it provides. And then there's uh, further links to more information if you want more details on every of these missions. Most likely you'll be interested in searching for, Senti for the Sentinel system. Um, uh, automatically Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B are activated. These are the two satellites that are uh, combined in this mission. And if you just would click search now, it would search the entire archive of Sentinel data for this particular area of interest. Of course, you can narrow down your search more. We actually revamped the search criteria, provided a little more flexibility for, for search, uh, for narrowing down your search. You can narrow down by date. Um, so say, I only want to find data sets over the last month. Um, so let's go from October 28th to, December, uh, to November 28th of this year. You can also, uh, if you already know a certain pass and frame, uh, that you want to search for, you can set that here, or you can leave that open for now. But you can also say um, search by flight direction. Maybe you're only interested in ascending or descending uh, data sets uh, and so on. Certain polarizations and beam modes can also be selected. Say maybe in this case, uh, I'm only interested in these in IW data sets. Um, again, more information you can find up here if you're interested in the different beam modes. IW is a data set is a high-resolution image data set that also allows you to do uh, INSAR uh, processing uh, to create the formation map. So once you set all criteria, you go and search. Um, the, um, the archive is searched for, for um, SAR data sets. And once the search, search is completed, you get all your results on the left-hand side. A very convenient. Every image um, gives you a little um, a preview um, that you can look at. You can also expand that if you click on it. So it shows you what this data set looks like. We provide you a color composite um, that's created from the dual pole information in Sentinel-1 data. And hopefully, if you're used to optical data, it helps you a little bit with interpreting what you see in the, in the data set. Um, if you wanted to, you could then download this data set directly from this little uh, pop-up screen. Uh, say, if you want you know, whatever data set you want, you can just click on Download here. And it's going to pull it to your machine uh, right away. If you're interested in uh, you know, downloading a whole time series of data sets, you might want to uh, work on your search a little more. Like right now, you might be only interested in one particular uh, path frame combination, maybe the one that's highlighted in green right now, um, which would be path 165, frame 98. And you can do that by setting some additional data filters on the top of the screen. Um, so you can click on this and you can say, oh, I only want to find path 165 and uh, frame, 90, uh, uh, frame 89. Is it not 89? Yes. And I can apply this. And it, 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 it removed all the other ones. And I only find this particular frame now and all the data sets, the repeated data sets for this frame. And you can click now at Add to Queue by type. You can now take all of the data sets, all, say, the single complex data sets, um, data sets that allow you to do interferometric SAR processing, you can all uh, add them to your queue. And your queue is shown similar to uh, an Amazon feature on the top right of your screen. So it shows you all your data sets that you've selected. And then you can download all of these data sets together. Uh, we sort of changed a little bit how these download options work. Uh, there's a little button here that says Data Download. If you click on that, it gives you two options. One is uh, called bulk, bulk uh, download. This uses a plugin, a browser plugin, to download data sets. And then there's also a Python script you can download to use Python uh, to uh, automatically download all your selected images. If you've never used either one of those two options, um, this interface gives you uh, some information. There's step-by-step -step directions that you can uh, look up to how to use the Python script or how to use um, the, um, uh, or how to install your, um, your MetaLink meta um, uh, plugin for your browser. So one last thing I wanted to say is 
so if you are uh, interested in higher level products, if you are interested in surface deformation features but you don't know how to process these uh, surface deformation maps yourself uh, using uh, INSAR processing, we're providing some higher level products already through Vertex. I'm going to get back to this here in a little bit. Um, but um, again, you can follow along later on if you are on looking this up on YouTube. On the very left, um, in, a, in addition to a, the geospatial search, we also allow you to do a search by missions. Uh, if you click on that and you get um, individual missions, for instance, of UAV SAR, you can look up, or of Air SAR, you can look up. But you also get um, a, a little tab that says beta, beta product, product. And these beta products give you higher level, mostly interferometric SAR products over certain areas of interest. For instance, a notable one was the uh, Kilauea volcanic eruption earlier this year in Hawaii. If you click on this um, uh, product, then it's going to start loading um, uh, interferometric SAR data sets. Um, so there's tons of those available, so it's, it's loading really slowly. Um, but once all of these data sets are loaded, uh, you can, it's going to zoom in to this area of interest, and um, you can um, download these, these interferometric data sets individually. You already see some previews here on the side. These are these Intel products. Um, um, those are provided as interferograms. They're also provided as, um, as um, uh, fully unwrapped deformation maps uh, in the download bundle you get. If you click on one of those, you see what these look like. So this one has mostly ocean, but up here you see some uh, phase information that is made available. So please experiment with that too. Um, we'll, I'll go, uh, I'm going to talk about this again a little bit later in the talk. So play around with Vertex. If you any, have any questions uh, with anything relating to Vertex, there's on the very top right, there's a contact button. If you click that contact button, um, there's a little interface that pops up. You can describe the problem you're having. This email is getting sent directly to our user services office, and, and our great staff will um, work on responding to you as fast as they can to address your issue. So this is Vertex. Uh, okay, as, as I said, play with Vertex uh, and, and experience it, and let us know what you are, if you run into any problems. Also, let us know if you really like it. We have, <laughs> mostly we get you know, only contacted when there are issues, but if you like it, please contact us as well. Um, on a side note, I'm not going to go into details, but um, the um, my, here we go. Um, data sets of, uh, of Sentinel-1 also, of course, are available through the European Space Agency directly, um, through their open access hub. I'm not going to go to the hub, but the, also there, the sign up is very easy, uh, very easily done. There's a link on this slide that will be shared with you that you can click on, and it leads you to the hub, and uh, there are instructions on how to log into the hub uh, on the web page. Um, so, so that's how you get SAR data. But, but SAR data, as I mentioned before, have been um, a little difficult uh, uh, to use, and, and, and still in some cases are. So at ASF and also other people in the community have worked heavily on creating some value-added processing systems that make it easier for you to utilize these data sets and turn them into higher level products. And so why are we, pre why are we thinking about creating these automatic processing services? And, and as I said, I mean, the processing flows for going from a raw SAR data set to a deformation map or to a fully, fully geocoded image time series or to other higher level products is not always straightforward for a variety of reasons, some of which are mentioned here. Data formats are often difficult and different for different systems. Data do not come natively geocoded, and they are often have some geometric distortions in them that need to be fixed. And then INSAR processing is complicated, and so on. So that's one reason why it might be useful for you to take advantage of some automatic processing services. The other ones also that are that these new SAR, SAR sensors that are providing these very large, very uh, regularly sampled data sets the data volumes of these data sets are becoming bigger and bigger, so that it, it sometimes it's just not feasible anymore for you to process all these data sets locally on your machine. So these uh, automatic uh, services may make you know, it easier for you to work with this very large volume data set. And then lastly, there is a lot of um, open source um, and, and freely available um, software packages right now that are being constantly improved. I'm going to show uh, links to those later on. Um, and, but 
still for non-SAR users, they have some uh, difficulty with usage. So also for that reason, um, you know, several automatic processing tools have been developed in the recent past, some of which uh, here at the DAC. And I'm going to present to you all of those. We'll focus on the DAC, but also give you links to other services outside of the DAC. So at the uh, ASF DAC, we have created value-added product uh, processing chains for a variety of products. Uh, the main ones are listed here. Uh, the first one on the very left, the so-called RTC image time series product, is basically a fully um, time series capable, um, fully geocoded and terrain corrected image product. Um, so it's uh, stacks of images that you can create um, and then pull into your GIS system. They're provided in GeoTIFF format, uh, easily usable GIS ready formats. You can pull them in your GIS system and then work with them there. Um, some of you may be interested. There may be, you might be from the hazard community. You might be interested in watching things like um, you know, flooding or, or other hazards events. Uh, for, for those uh, interested in these, feature, in these kind of things, we've also developed some automatic change detection uh, products that you can directly utilize and work with in GIS environments. We have color composites. Those have been found to be useful for people that haven't been using much with grayscale images in the past. Uh, they um, like these RGB images because they give a little more an in intuitive understanding of uh, what's, what's on the ground. And then lastly, these surface deformation maps that are produced using INSAR processing. Um, and those are also made available to you through these services. Um, so to share these services with you, we have created a um, processing system that we call HYPE. So the HYP3 uh, is pronounced HYPE. It stands for Hybrid Pluggable Processing Pipeline. It's a fully cloud-based value-added processing um, prototyping system uh, using both Sentinel-1 and ALOS data. It, um, it uh, allows us to uh, prototype uh, higher level products from Sentinel, product, from Sentinel, for instance, make them available to the community like you. Uh, so you, you are allowed to a certain extent, um, to a limited extent, to utilize the service. And the goal, what we hope is that you use these products, you give us feedback on uh, you know, how well these products work or what kind of issues you might have with the products. We use that feedback to iterate and improve them and then eventually roll them into an operational product and which we then can serve out to you um, more easily or more directly through, say, our Vertex uh, search clients. Um, I'm going to show you the, the interface here in a, in a little bit. Um, there's a web link um, on the slide uh, that you can either type down or, or just uh, pull down the slides later on. Uh, but you know, we, we implemented all of this in the cloud. This is great because it gives us all the capabilities, uh, access to all the capability, capabilities of the cloud, like elastic scaling. So if there's a lot of users requesting data, we can scale up the, um, the processing system to meet demands. It also uh, allows us to be efficient and, and, um, and financially um, um, you know, cost eff effective with our data processing. Uh, once you sign up and uh, data sets were processed from you, from you, the system will also automatically send you an email uh, with a link um, to the product for download. Uh, I will show you that also in a second. So uh, let me just uh, show you the system here real quick, how to use it. So this is the, um, the web interface uh, for, for the Hype uh, web client. Um, uh, hopefully a very clean interface on the splash screen. It shows you a little bit the kinds of things you can do, uh, terrain correction, change detection, INSAR processing, and so on. Um, it again requires a login. Uh, this login is the same login that you used for Vertex. So the Earth data login also works on, on this system. Just a note, if you, if you utilize this service for the first time, you will not be right away activated. So give us about 24 hours for, to activate you. Right now, we manually activate every user. Um, also keep in mind that we have a limit right now on how many data sets you can process per month that you should be aware of. Just briefly how you use it. The easiest way of using the service is through uh, setting up a subscription. If you look on the top left, you can click on the subscription button. Once you're there, it shows you all of your ongoing uh, subscriptions. Uh, and in the bottom, there's a, a, a button for, for creating a new subscription. So if you're there for the first time, uh, that's the only thing you see. If you click on new subscriptions, you get, again, hopefully a very simple to use interface. 
you can uh, give your subscription a name that makes sense to you. Say, I want to do, uh, I don't know, flood mapping in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, then you can pick from one of the uh, value-added processing services that we have in place. Uh, you can read up uh, on this web page what all of these processing systems mean. You can do inside processing. We have a variety of different software packages in, uh, implemented here. Or you can do uh, image RTC image processing, say that's what I want to do right now. Then you set up your area of interest uh, through, if I can find Fairbanks, through again simple uh, creation of boundary box. And then you can set some other parameters. You can say, I want to start this service in, on November 1st. If you don't set the start date, the start date will be today or whenever you create the subscription. And you can set an end date and say, I want to watch this thing for about a month. If you don't set an end date, it's going to go indefinitely until you manually stop it. There are some, some uh, additional options you can set to narrow down, similar as in vertex, by polarization, by orbit direction, and so on. Say, I want only ascending data now. If you click then on Submit, this subscription service is automatically set up. Um, it will go into the archive, find all the existing data of your area of interest um, for, that matches your time range. It's going to process them to whatever product you've selected. And then once the product is completed, just to give you an, an idea, you get um, a, an email that may look like this where it says like, hey, your data set is done. This is an Intel data set. It gives you a preview, a download link. It tells you a little bit how large it is and a little bit of additional information. So each product is being emailed to you um, um, this way. So you know, play with this service uh, mindfully. If you may, uh, don't process too many data sets. But uh, you know, then also, hopefully, you can provide us feedback on how this service works for you feedback on the usability of the interface, but also the usability of the data sets. I have a separate slide. If, you, if, if, the, if it was too fast for you how to set up a subscription, there's a separate slide that you can look at uh, to walk through the subscription service. Now, just one example uh, how we use this. We have actually automated this uh, subscription service uh, for hazard events, uh, mostly for volcanic uh, and, and earthquake hazards. So for those, we are mining existing uh, notification systems. So we connected our uh, subscription service to the USGS uh, earthquake and, and volcano notification service. Uh, whenever USGS announces an earthquake, we look at the parameters of the quake or the volcanic eruptions. And if it meets certain criteria, we kick off certain products automatically. And we actually pump out these products onto a public web page. Uh, it's called SARViews. Uh, that you might be interested in. Um, here is the Sarviews portal. Um, it's publicly accessible. Um, and there's a link on this page again. Um, if, we, um, if you go to this web page, this is what this web page looks like. Um, again, on top, you have a little map. Each symbol on the map uh, is a, an event that we are watch, watching actively. Uh, active watched uh, events are the ones that are colored. And then the grayscale ones are ones that events that we watched in the past. Data is still available, but we're not processing data actively anymore. Um, and say, um, you know, each this is an earthquake event here. If you click on it, um, you give you get some information on the event, and you can go to the detail page. And this detail page then gives you access to all of the um, data sets that have been processed so far. So in this case, this is an earthquake. So we have interferogram products, and um, they are split up into the co-seismic uh, products and the post-seismic products, and then there are some image products that you can download. And uh, you can download them by simply clicking at each of these links, or you can download them all by clicking on the Download All Products uh, tab. Again, utilize that service. If you have any questions, uh, email me, um, and um, uh, we'll try to address those. So just to show you, I mean, these data sets are being used. These are some data sets for the Hawaiian event. Uh, where there was both an, a volcanic and an earthquake uh, signature in, in the data sets. All of these data sets are available. Uh, if you're interested in that particular one, this is event 80. There's a link on this slide uh, where you can download all the data sets. And then people have been using it to do geophysics with it to understand things like the amount of magma, the depth of magma that was moved around in this event. Um, so outside of ASF, there are other uh, groups that have uh, done similar services. I'm going to briefly mention them here. 
and provide you links. Uh, so it's the ARIA service provided by JPL that probably was the first value-added, fully functional value-added process, processing service that was around. Uh, there's Comet, uh, which is done by a group in England. And there's the TEP, the te thematic exploitation platforms that are provided to you by ESA. Uh, just briefly, ARIA has a very similar goals to SAR views. It is mostly focused on watching uh, events, uh, seismic and volcanic events. Uh, it then uh, mines data sets from a variety of, of sources, runs them through cloud-based uh, processing platforms, and spits out higher level products, such, such as fairgrounds, image products, and, and change detection uh, information. Um, if you want to, uh, some of these uh, products are already on Vertex. I showed you earlier the, the so-called um, uh, beta products. Those are coming from the ARIA and the, and the uh, system. Um, and uh, you can find them on Vertex by following this Vertex link on this slide. You can also find them on the Earth Data Search Engine, which is another NASA unified search, search engine that's available. And uh, you can also go directly to the ARIA uh, website. Um, <clears throat> the ARIA-search uh, website here, the top link, allows you to um, actually create an account and then process data sets yourself. Uh, to get access, you have to send an email to the ARIA team, but please do so. Also contact the ARIA team if you have any comments um, uh, of, uh, for their service um, um, or if you want to give them some feedback on their product. This is uh, just an information on the Comet uh, project. This is a project run by the University of Leeds in England in collaboration with the European Space a a Agency. Their goal is to process um, deformation maps for all uh, seismically and volcanically active regions of the globe. So they're interested in processing data over uh, all uh, of these areas. Um, there's a link uh, to their, to their um, project web page on this slide. If you, there you can read up more information on the project. And there are some links on uh, where you can get data. So all of their um, uh, interferometric products are available um, uh, through the link on the top of the screen. And they also have some more information for certain volcanic um, um, uh, targets on the bottom of the screen. Uh, for some reason, the service is offline right now, but I'm expecting that they will put this service back online here uh, shortly. So also play with these and, and provide feedback either to me or them directly on, on, uh, on the service. Lastly, I want to mention the, uh, the thematic exploitation platforms. The European Space Agency also saw a need for providing people access to um, these very large volume data sets in a, in a more effective cloud environment. And they also saw uh, benefit in providing some processing tools on that platform so that every, you can build your own processing workflows directly on that platform. And uh, the nice thing about the exploitation platform is that there are separate uh, platforms for different applications. So if you follow this link on the side uh, of this uh, on the screen here, you get to this main splash screen. There you can uh, pick the platform that best uh, corresponds or fits your needs. There's a geohazard one, coastal, forestry, hydrology, whatever your application may be. Uh, if you click on these, there's a simple sign-on that's required. Um, but once you're there, you can do one of two things. You can either take advantage of higher level products that people, that other people have processed and made available to you um, and can download those directly, uh, or you can uh, uh, process your own data sets yourself utilizing, utilizing their services. So uh, please also give this a shot. Um, compare it to some of the other services that are around. We would love your feedback on any of those. You know, if you find something that is really nice on, on the thematic ex exploitation platforms uh, that you want also NASA to be providing to its users, please uh, contact me um, or, or contact ASF. I'm going to provide some email addresses on the very last slide. And let us know, and we'll try our best to, um, to make uh, similar services available to you. So it's a, long story short, there's a growing amount of these uh, tools out there uh, that hopefully meet um, your needs, and I really would encourage you to take advantage of. Um, and um, the main thing at this point is all of these tools are developing, um, and um, and please, you know, provide feedback to us or to the providers of these different tools. That's really something that people are very interested in: is to improve these services, make them most useful. Your feedback is really key. So back to the ASF DAC. 
Outside of the uh, processing services, we provide additional user support and have enhanced additional components of the user support. One of the things that I want, you, uh, want to encourage uh, you to use or take advantage of are the, the ASF star data recipe uh, library. Uh, what the recipes are, so, so you may be a new to SAR, you might have a very specific application in mind. It, it might be mapping, it might be change detection, it might be intel processing, but you don't really know exactly how to do that yourself. So this is, this is what these recipes are for. Uh, these recipes provide end-to-end -end solutions for commonly requested data processing workflows. Um, you're providing solutions for various processing package, uh, packages and for various operating systems, so for you know, mostly Windows, Linux, and Macs. And then what's nice about these <coughs> um, recipes, and it's shown in the slide also, we're using sort of a C-slope style, I call it uh, difficulty rating. Um, so for every of these recipes, um, I'm, we are telling you with a symbol whether this recipe is easy to do, or required some, requires some intermediate skills, or is more advanced. Uh, and, and as you know from skiing, diamonds are the more advanced ones. The library is growing. I can show you the latest uh, state of the library. Again, the link on the bottom of the page uh, gets you to, uh, um, to the um, recipe interface if it loads. Here we go. So this is what the latest set of, of, of libraries uh, look or, or of recipes uh, looks like. Um, so there's uh, you know, a link uh, that leads you to all of the individual ones. Um, note on top of the screen, um, there is a link where the mouse pointer is right now, which says request a new data recipe. So this is an important one for you. If you have a recipe in mind or you, need, you have an application that is currently not uh, supported with a recipe, uh, please click on that link. Uh, it pops up uh, uh, this interface that you've seen before. Provide a clear subject line, something like, um, you know, need um, a recipe, um, you know, for, you know, help or help with, with processing uh, polarimetric SAR data. And then we can create a recipe for you that, that addresses your need. So that's an important button for you. Um, if you have find an, a recipe that you're interested in, say you want to do an inundation mapping, you can click on that recipe, you get to a sub-page which has a little more information. So here we provide you a variety of different ways of how you can do inundation mapping um, um, you know, with different software tools and, and with different operating systems. You may find one that you like, like this one. Uh, then it gives you more information on what this recipe does, it gives you some example products. And then on the left there are uh, download links. This is a recipe that particularly is done in Spanish. So we're trying to um, provide more and more of these recipes, both in English and Spanish. Um, and so if, if that's a need to you, please um, let us know, and we'll ramp up efforts in that direction. I'm coming slowly uh, to the end. Uh, I want to make you aware that we also have a training uh, website. Oops, the, up, the, the training website has sort of two uh, purposes. One of them is to make you aware of upcoming trainings that either ASF is doing or that are uh, being made available by other groups in the community, such as uh, the GMT-SAR group, UNAFCO, or the COMET group. Um, on this side, we also share other information, like upcoming relevant conferences, uh, particularly conferences where you might uh, meet people from ASF and you can get in touch with people from ASF. There's a link to this web page, too. Uh, please um, go there and, um, and um, um, either look at existing stuff. Also, if you go there, there's a way for you to, um, um, we encourage you to, um, to request uh, trainings as well. You can request trainings either by emailing me directly or on every page of the ASF main uh, interface, on the very left, there's a feedback button. Again, if you click that feedback button, you can send us an email and you can say like, hey, you know, I have a group of so and so many people would like to request to start training on a certain topic. And then we'll get in touch with you and see if we can figure out how to do it. So tra start trainings are a big thing for us. We uh, involve, uh, we get in touch with end users in several ways. One of the things that we've done more extensively recently is we've worked with end user groups, also on the development of new products. So our hype interface, as we said, features a certain set of products already. 
Um, and uh, this, this suite of products is, uh, can be expanded. So if you, have, um, if you are working for an organization, you're interested in higher level products, you can contact us and we can try to work with you on, on, on ramping up uh, or, or in integrating new products. The way we've, we've been doing this in the past, for instance, with a group called NASA Sport, is we first worked with them offline on developing a new tool, and then we brought actually people up to Fairbanks for a limited period of time to finish the implementation and do some validation on the product. In addition to that interaction, as I said, we do uh, regular SAR trainings. Um, we've been doing them both in, this, in the United States but also abroad. Uh, this is an example of a training we did with a team colleague, Joseph Kellendorfer, who is here on the very left in the slide. This was a training we did in Africa, <coughs> focused on, on forest monitoring, and that's a training we did in Nepal, also focused on forest monitoring. So we are interested in, in, uh, in that too, if, if that's of your interest. Again, to request star trainings, either click on the feedback button on the web page or contact me or the USO, the user services office, and the email addresses are uh, in, the, in the slide deck that you can download. So one last note before I wrap up. Um, we, um, we also have been, and this is more through my appointment as a professor at the university, I'm teaching a full semester class on microwave remote sensing. In order to support the ASF community a little more, I've made all of the class material available uh, through an online web, web portal that's linked here. So if you go there, you see information on this class. Um, there, on the lectures, um, all of the uh, lecture material is freely and, and openly available, so you can download all, this, all the individual slide decks. There are links to lab sessions that you can walk through, um, and so please uh, you know, look at that too. Uh, lit relevant uh, literature is listed as well. So that's a resource that you can utilize as well. Uh, one interesting thing is, thing is that we do have an installment of this class coming up in spring 2019, and uh, we have a limited amount of um, remote participation seats uh, for this class. So if you have a student that would uh, like to take uh, uh, this, this class remotely, uh, there are options to do so. Um, and um, I provide a link on the web page right now how you can register for the class um, uh, as a remote student. Okay, so uh, to wrap this up, um, just a few final notes. And so really through um, this, the, uh, these amazing new instruments that have been made available, Sentinel-1 foremost, but also the amazing NISAR instrument that's coming, uh, coming up in the next few years, uh, there, there has been a, an increasing amount of data available, freely and openly available data. And uh, this also has spawned an, a dramatic increase in, in the number of users that want to take advantage of these data sets. So many of you might be new users of SAR. And that's really why we ran our training. This is why the community as a whole has invested in value-added product services. So again, please uh, call out to you, take advantage of them, uh, give us feedback so that we can make these services more useful to you. Um, just at the very end, I, I list a few more links uh, that you might be interested in. I have my radar class up one more time. The, you may be aware of the NASA RSET group. RSET stands for Applied Remote Sensing and Training. They have rolled out uh, a number of uh, webinars on different remote sensing topics. There are a couple of them that are now available for SAR, uh, and I provide the links. Please uh, look at those. So those are provided in English and Spanish. Um, there's a group called SAR-EDU um, in, in Europe that has um, rolled out um, um, a massive open online class on radar remote sensing that you can look at also. There's a link to that as well. And as I mentioned earlier, there are some open uh, access um, and, and open use SAR processing tools, tools available to you, notably uh, the NASA uh, uh, provided ICE tool and then the GMT SAR tool uh, provided by a group in um, at the uh, Scripps Institute of uh, Oceanography. Um, there are also trainings that relate particularly uh, to those tools, and I have links to the, where the trainings uh, are being posted, and there are links to where you can get those software tools. So please also take advantage of those. And that's it, so thank you for your extended um, uh, patience and interest. Uh, if you have feedback on anything that was presented today, please contact one of those two email addresses and uh, um, I'm well, uh, now ready, I think, to answer some of your questions.
Okay, thank you, Franz. Uh, thanks, everybody. Before we do that, we are going to move to the final set of polling questions. We're running just a couple of minutes behind here. Um, so we'll give these questions about three minutes or so, and then I'll leave the virtual meeting space open um, at the end. If you think of something, you can type it into the Q&A pod. And while we're doing that, uh, Franz, Peter Griffith is also on the line and asked, was there anything you wanted for him to announce to the Above Science team? Uh, yes, please. Uh, so Above is uh, another project that is um, utilizing uh, a lot of star data. So, so Peter, please, please uh, introduce Above to the, to the group. You may have to press star six. Yes. Although we don't want other people to unmute themselves, if you don't mind, um, because we are recording the webinar. Thank you. So Peter, you'll have to press star six. Are you there? <laughs> Maybe he can chime in when he's ready. Yes, that sounds good. And Franz, we need to promote you in as presenter again here. Um, let's see. So Q and A's. Jennifer, are you pulling up the Q? Yes. Okay. Okay, and just a note to everybody, we, we've received a, a lot of questions during this webinar. Um, we'll go through them in the order that they were received, but please keep in mind that if, when we, it's quite possible we're going to run out of time before we're able to answer all of these questions. So Franz will be receiving the question and, uh, and answer log, and he will be able to address your inquiries offline if they were not answered today, okay? We're going to give this just one more minute um, just in the spirit of time, because I really do want to move to the questions. Again, there were quite a few. All right, so another minute, then we'll transition to the Q&A. Okay, everybody, at this point, we're going to transition to the Q&A. And our first question was asked um, quite a few minutes ago. So let me go ahead and find that, and we will get started here. If you'll bear with me for just a moment. There are quite a few, so I will need to locate that. So our first question was, in the downloading option, which is better, SLC or the other one while downloading the image? Um, can, can you repeat that uh, briefly? Um, I was, yes. Uh, so in time. the downloading option, which is better, SLC or the other one when download, <coughs> while downloading an image? Yes. Um, so it depends a little bit on your application. The SLC uh, product is, is the, probably the more versatile of them in the sense that you can do uh, both the imaging, as you can create, create a geocoded image from it, and uh, you can use it in your GIS. But you can also use it for INSAR processing. So if you're not entirely sure, then maybe that's the product to go for. The downside of the SOC is that it's uh, very voluminous, uh, it's very big. So if, if, you, if you know that your main uh, goal is to do mapping and to do image analysis in, um, uh, say, a GIS environment, uh, then I would go uh, alternatively with the so-called GRD product, the ground range detected product. Uh, this is um, fully functional for mapping. Uh, it is stripped, though, of the phase information. You can't do uh, the deformation mapping anymore. But if that's not of your interest, I would go with the GID instead because of its smaller size. Okay, thank you, Franz. Our second question is, what software is ASF using to create the interferograms um, and unwrapped deformation results available in the beta products tab? Yeah, so the beta product, um, 
uh, data that's listed right now. They, they were processed with the, uh, uh, by JPL's ARIA system through a project that's called Griffin, not so important, but it's, that uh, system uses ICE. So if you used, uh, ICE stands for oh, Interferometric um, Scientific um, Computing Environment. Hey, I got it right. Um, and uh, it's, it's a tool that was put together by JPL uh, and with the University of, uh, with Caltech and Stanford for a while. Um, it's uh, publicly available, and uh, that's uh, behind uh, the interferograms that you can download um, from the ARIA system, and then you can download from our uh, beta product. Okay, thank you. Our next question is, what unwrapping method or tool is used to derive the surface displacement maps you make available, and is there QC? Yes, so that's a very good question. Um, the, um, depending on what software package is used, so for the ARIA products and for the beta products that are available, um, those are uh, unwrapped with a minimum, so-called minimum cost flow unwrapper, particularly uh, Snafu, uh, which also is an open source tool that's been uh, put together by Stanford for, for a long time. Um, there is uh, some QA done. It's actually very difficult to QA phase unwrapping. Uh, the, the JPL has has uh, developed and implemented some deep learning tools, uh, and in fact, um, you could even participate in helping people catch phase and wrapping errors. So scientists are clicking on on, on images that have phase and wrapping errors, and this is training a deep learning tool to catch them automatically. Um, because they are beta products, though, they are not um, as extensively validated as our official. Um, 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 approved products that you can find, the other products you can find in Vertex. That's why they are classified as beta products and not as a regular product. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. The next question is, is there a guide for use to choose which kind of data we need for our specific projects? For example, when you were downloading Landsat and there are two levels. Yeah. So uh, for in, in Vertex, if you click uh, on the links to the individual sensors, there's a little bit of information on that. Um, actually, um, right now, we, we are working on uh, a handbook that's going to be made available by NASA in collaboration with a group called Silver Carbon, or an initiative called Silver Carbon. This book uh, is going to be available both as a hard copy but also as, a, as an online um, a digital book an ebook, and that one has um, tables in there with a little more explanation about, okay, if this is your application, this is likely the data set to use. I think the book, the release of the book is going to be announced at uh, AGU, as far as I know, uh, and, and then will be available sometime early next year. Uh, so we can take, make sure that we announce that once it's out. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the next question. How does automatic SAR processing consider the atmospheric and environmental conditions? Every site and area is different and needs specific attention. Like you said, INSAR is very error prone. How do we know the automatic results are reliable? Yes, um, so <clears throat> the, um, uh, as, as was mentioned before, the main issue is, is, is the phase unwrapping process. Uh, most uh, other steps up to uh, getting the interferogram are now reasonably robust um, and or, or robust enough so that they work in a large percentage of cases. Phase unwrapping is the main issue. So if there's less coherence, then phase unwrapping is error prone. Um, as these products are currently beta products, um, their validation and error correction is is limited to, as I mentioned before, the, uh, the, the uh, deep learning method and the automatic methods that were being implemented. Um, and um, atmospheric errors um, are currently still in the interferograms. Um, and uh, we are actually both team, or the, the ARIA team, but also our team are in the process of rolling out correction layers that are being added uh, to the data package. So there, there will be an, an uh, atmospheric uh, correction layer, phase correction layer that you can or cannot apply depending on whether or not you choose so. Um, so that's another way of, of uh, displaying to you potential error sources and giving you the capability to remove them. Okay, great, thank you. So the next question is, is there an important, well, let me, is there, 
Is there an important application of surface deformation maps in geohazard management and landmass process? I'm uh, not sure. Yeah, so, so, so deformation maps can be very useful in hazard management. Um, some obvious ones is uh, if you look at, um, uh, for instance, landslides. Uh, so many, uh, many of the landslides that eventually um, have cat catastrophic failure, they, they are likely, or many of them move before, they may move faster after rain events. So, um, so interferometric SAR data may be a, use, may be a way of, of uh, you know, monitoring their, their deformation patterns and sort of see if there's any acceleration or change. Uh, they, they've also been used a lot in uh, monitoring infrastructure, um, uh, for instance, dams, uh, stability of dams, st stability of levees, um, it's, it's of relevance there. And then after an event happens, um, so volcanoes, of course, they, they, many of them, not all of them, but many do deform um, um, uh, regularly when magma moves around. And, and INSAR can be one, uh, though, of course, not the only uh, way of, of, of trying to assess the hazards that are come from a, coming from a certain volcano. And then after the fact, the interferometric SAR products can tell you a little bit about the, um, the physics of an event, which can then help you understand for an earthquake, uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, the shaking that happened, the damage that may have happened on the ground, and uh, coherence information, which is a byproduct of INSAR processing, has been used in the past to look at uh, assessing damage um, after an earthquake event as well. So I think they have a variety of applications. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Franz. The next question, does HYPE have the capability to be used with other commercially available SAR data? Um, that's currently HYPE is hooked up to ASF's archives only, particularly the archives that are freely available, which are uh, Center One, of course, but on also uh, ALOS Pulsar. I didn't mention that earlier, but ALOS, ASF has been allowed by JAXA to provide its um, ALOS data holdings uh, free and open. So also those are hooked up to, to HYPE. We are actually working on transforming HYPE into um, a service that, that may be, uh, can be used by an, an, an end user directly. And one of the goals is to also make it possible to hook it up to an end user's own uh, archives of SAR data, say if somebody has Terrasar data or, or other um, uh, data sets uh, in, their, in their own archives, uh, then we want to be able to uh, hook up the system to these archives also. Okay, thank you, Franz. The next question is, what is the number of data sets you can evaluate at each month? Oh, I, um, I, 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 can't, I have to get back to you on that. I know there's a number, um, but I don't know exactly what that number is. But, but if you um, can forward me uh, the email address, I can get back to the person I, with, I with the number. I certainly will. You'll, you'll have yep. all the information, because I, I don't think we'll, we'll run out of time for all these questions. So the next question is, um, does HYPE cover, I'm not sure this is worded, how high, you know, does HYPE have global coverage and how have you validated with other SAR data? Um, uh, so yes, so HYPE uh, can be, so it's, it's near global. Um, most of the higher level product production requires a, uh, um, a DM that is of, of sufficient quality. Uh, ASF is maintaining uh, what we call a best layer DEM, which is a validated DEM product that we uh, manually looked at and did outlier detection and so on. And it covers most of the globe. What's currently not covered is Siberia. Um, and I think we are in the process of rolling in uh, an Antarctic DEM, but in the past the Antarctic DEM was also not available. So most land masses outside of the Antarctic in Siberia um, you can do data processing on. Um, the second question was like, oh, have we validated? So the, um, the, the processing flows that are implemented, they have been validated. The RTC processing flow has been validated against an operational workflow that we've implemented for ALOS Pulsar, and we've compared those for accuracy. The INSA workflows, we actually compared, we did a recent comparison between different value-added product uh, tools. So we compared the hype uh, outputs to the uh, output for the same data frame from, for instance, the ARIA system uh, to, to make sure that the, uh, the products are the same. So there was some validation done to uh, ensure that there is consistency among different providers. 
Okay, the next question I'm going to combine two into one is PS INSAR processing available and is speckle offset tracking INSAR available? So again, is PS INSAR processing available and is speckle offset tracking INSAR available? So we currently don't have any PS INSAR tools um, um, that are being that have been rolled out to the public. We are um, <clears throat> Uh, JPL, both JPL and also us, we are working on um, uh, integrating SBUS type uh, uh, tools into the service, but currently there are none. Uh, you can't uh, do time series analysis yet uh, with uh, the Hype uh, toolbox um, um, uh, right now. Um, the second question was, I forgot. Oh, the um, oh, the speckle tracking. Um, so we do have a, a beta uh, product in in Hype. As far as I remember, let me actually double check that real quick. Um, for uh, speckle tracking, let's see if that's online right now. Just a second. Oh, is it? Um, let's see. It's, it's currently so not online, but we can, roll that, we can roll that out again. So there is a, we have a, a toolbox in place. Uh, it's currently not on the web page for reasons I don't know. Uh, it was mostly used for glacier tracking, but it would be also available for tracking other things. OK, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, uh, is Pulsar data freely available? So the, uh, the ALOS uh, Pulsar data holdings, holdings that are held by ASF, those, as I said earlier, were, uh, we were allowed by JAXA to make them freely and openly available. So all of our AS, uh, uh, ALOS Pulsar holdings, you can download uh, freely and openly just like uh, Sentinel-1 data. Okay, excellent. The next question, I think you may have answered this, is ASF using SNAFU for the unwrapping? Yeah, it depends on, um, it, it, when, I showed you earlier when you use Hype, you have different uh, software tools that you can pick from. If you utilize uh, either the uh, Sentinel-1 toolbox or you use uh, processing using ICE, both of those use SNAFU for phase unwrapping. Uh, there's another option that you can pick from, which is Gamma, the Gamma Remote Sensing software. That one uses a minimum cost flow unwrapper that is provided by Gamma, which is different from SNAFU, but uh, leads to uh, very comparable results. OK, thank you, Franz. The next question is, what software is behind Hype? S S1 T or the S1 Sentinel-1 toolbox? And if so, are the production graphs available? Um, so, there, so as I said, we have a variety of uh, systems that are supported. For INSA processing, we have Sentinel-1 Toolbox, we have ICE, we have GMT-5SAR, and we have Gamma. And for RTC processing, we have Sentinel-1 Toolbox and Gamma. The, uh, the uh, graphs are available in the sense that if you go to our data recipes, there you find the recipe with uh, the, the processing graph uh, for both INSA processing and sort of geocoding RTC processing. So that you can't download them from directly from Hype, but you can go to the recipes and you can find them there. Okay, thank you. And I just wanted to note that um, we are running out of time for questions. However, uh, our speaker will be in the virtual meeting space for, no, for another 10 minutes or so after we finish. And so perhaps he could type in some answers to some of these questions. Um, and, and if not, then we'll certainly get in touch with all of those uh, participants who had an inquiry that was not answered offline, okay? The next question is, is there, is there any plan to include multi-inferometry, for example, PSI, S, SBAS, et cetera? Um, yes, so, so currently we don't have uh, um, SPAS or PSI implemented, uh, or, or we, not, we have it implemented, but we don't make it available to users, uh, partly because you know, there was a question earlier about how do you validate this, uh, so it becomes complicated when you do the inversion. But as I said, we are trying to uh, turn the service into something that can be used by an end user in the cloud. So you can uh, log into the archive, that's the goal, and then utilize these workflows uh, in a cloud environment. And there we will have open source tools available, and one of them is the um, the um, SBAS uh, inversion uh, toolbox giant uh, that was produced by Fuchsia Gram and his team um, at JPL. So there will be uh, accessibility to those um, uh, in the future. Okay, we have time for one more question. Looks like the downloaded image pixelates when you zoom in. What resolution is openly available? 
um, um, for the for the uh, for the quick looks or for for the high process data? It doesn't say, right? So for uh, the quick looks are just quick looks. The quick looks on our web page are lower resolution. The product, if you download the product, it's going to be it's it's at full resolution. Um, the high process data sets you have uh, options. So if you if you process a um, um, RTC, a, a geocoded image, you have options to uh, either process to 30 meters or, or a 10 meter product, for instance. But uh, for each of those, if you um, if you look at the advanced processing options, it it, it tells you more about uh, the resolution of the product. And also, there's a a text uh, file uh, and uh, sort of a readme file with every product you download that should explain the resolution of the data set. Okay, thank you, Franz. At this point, what we'll do is we are going to, I'd like to thank everybody for participating today and also thank our speaker, Dr. Meyer. And what we'll do is we will log off from the audio component of the webinar, but I will leave the virtual meeting space open. Our speaker will still be online for the next 10 minutes, and I'm hoping he'll be able to answer um, some of these additional questions. So thanks to all of you. Um, for participating. You'll see on the slide to the left a thank you slide. If you go to tinyurl.com or Theta Webinar, we do provide direct links to all of our webinars dating back to 2013. Um, you can also sign up to our webinar announcement listserv there as well. Um, so with that, thank you everybody. Um, we'll log off from the audio, but again, I'll leave the virtual meeting space open. All so right, I, I type so in... If I respond, I type in the response. I, I can't verbally respond. Is that what you're saying? Yes, you would have to okay. type it in. Yes. Okay, will do. All right, well, thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot for listening. All right. Bye bye now. Bye bye. -bye.